Uh, today, we are joined by speakers from the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project. Rhea Pereira is a supervising attorney at Pulp, where she provides legal representation, training, consultation, and support services in utility and energy matters affecting low-income residents and community organizations in Pennsylvania. Her co-presenter, Giovanna Brackville, serves as the Utility Justice Project Manager at Pulp, where she works to address and alleviate the unique barriers to utility service faced by historically underserved communities to ensure that low-income customers can access and maintain safe and stable utility services. During today's webinar, Gio and Ria will provide an overview of the current utility assistance landscape, statewide resources to assist people having trouble paying for utilities, and how to protect individuals and families from loss of utility services. They're gonna share about upcoming programs, such as LIHEAP, Pool Home Repair, Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, and more. They will cover important eligibility requirements and deadlines, common misconceptions and barriers, and other emerging issues, as well as consumer tenant rights and more. And with that, I'm excited to turn it over to our wonderful speakers, and I will pass it over to you now. Thank you. And hi, everyone. Once again, I'm Maria Pereira. I'm the supervising attorney with Pulp. And joining me today is uh, Gio Brackville. She is our utility justice project manager. So we're here today to talk about utility assistance and what you need to know about it. So we're just going to jump into the presentation. But uh, like Jen mentioned, please feel free to utilize that Q&A as we're going to try to keep this as interactive as possible. So to get us started, let's give some more information about Pulp for those of you who might not be familiar with us. We are the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project. We are a statewide legal service project. Uh, we are administratively housed within Regional Housing Legal Services, and we're also a member of the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network. Pulp's mission is to secure just and equitable access to safe and affordable utility service for Pennsylvanians experiencing poverty. And we do this through a variety of ways. For example, uh, the training and webinar that we're on right now is one example of how we disseminate information about utility access and affordability. We also engage in legal representation for individuals and groups, uh, as well as policy advocacy and a variety of supportive services and consultation. We can go to the next slide. So just give you a little bit of wayfinding for today. We are going to be talking about uh, utility programs and utility affordability. So we're going to give you uh, some preliminary uh, distinctions between what we call regulated and unregulated utilities. We'll talk about why uh, that matters. And then we'll talk about some utility affordability programs. Also give you some uh, tools for preventing termination, as well as tools and strategies for connecting and reconnecting to service for people who are without access to services. We'll talk more specifically about tenant protections and some specific utility rules that govern tenant and landlord utility access. And we'll give you some information also about the PUC dispute process. That's the uh, utility commission in Pennsylvania, as well as some uh, ending resources and referrals uh, to leave you with. So first, uh, topic, let's talk about utility and security and utility affordability and why that matters and why it really is highly intersectional. So utility access and uh, on the flip side, utility and security has a connection and interplays with a variety of other areas. So uh, we're here, obviously, uh, to talk about uh, utility and housing, but also think about the intersectionality between utility and security and health. So lack of utilities can lead to a variety of negative health outcomes, including exposure to unsafe temperatures, exposure to other weather conditions. Uh, there's a variety and a number of heat waves that are going through our country right now, which I think throws this in issue into a pretty sharp relief, uh, as well as inability to clean and sanitize a home. So uh, one 
statistic we've given on this slide is that utility moratoria uh, nationwide uh, was estimated to reduce COVID-19 infection rates by 4.4% and reduce mortality rates as a result of COVID from seven point, uh, by approximately, I should say, 7.4%. So this really spotlights the importance of utility access and then uh, how it intersects with the need to clean and sanitize homes and keep people healthy and safe in their homes. And then uh, utilities all also include water. So think about uh, access to clean drinking water, access to drinking water at all uh, for people who might uh, have had their water uh, shut off. And as I mentioned, uh, utility and security is obviously very intersectional with housing and housing issues. Uh, people who have utilities um, or cut off. It can lead to things like eviction, foreclosure, homelessness. If a tenant is uh, losing utility services as a result of landlord action, it can be considered a constructive eviction or self-help eviction. And then once you're without that utility service, it can be very difficult to relocate to new housing. Uh, if you've lost it for a uh, a variety of reasons, including non-payment, it might also make individuals, uh, tenants, unable to access uh, public or private housing options in the future. And then it, utility and security can also have a variety of negative impacts related to family security. So it can lead to interruption in family unity in the uh, sense of child custody. A, ch a child might be removed from a home. It can contribute to economic abuse and control if you're looking at potentially a victim of domestic violence. And then it can hinder child learning and development. So if you think about uh, access to electric service, access to even broadband service, and lack of off, it can absolutely impact child learning and development as well. And then uh, finally, utility and security can lead to a variety of financial impacts, including harming credit reports, potential liens if you're looking at a municipal utility that might encumber a property, and then full, uh, food spoilage, uh, burst pipes, and a variety of other uh, structural issues that could lead to financial harm as well. So highly intersectional and very, very important to uh, these other areas as well. So let's talk next about utility affordability and specifically some utility run assistance programs that can help people get closer and hopefully achieve utility affordability. So at the outset of this conversation, we wanted to make a distinction here between what constitutes regulated utilities and unregulated utilities. Now, regulated utilities are those Normally, those larger electric, gas, and water companies, they're under the jurisdiction of uh, the PUC, which is the Public Utility Commission in Pennsylvania. And uh, as a result, complaints can be taken to the PUC. We'll give you some information about filing complaints later in this presentation with the PUC. And because they're under the PUC, they also have to follow the rules and regulations that the PUC has set related to billings, collections, and terminations. Because they're under the jurisdiction of the PUC, they're more likely to have those assistance programs that we're going to be talking about. On the flip side, are those unregulated utilities. Now, these are normally those smaller uh, municipal utilities, those electric co-ops. The exception we make here is PGW, PWSA. They are what we call munis, but they are under the jurisdiction of the PUC. They are larger. But if you're looking at generally those municipal utilities, those electric co-ops, they generally will be those unregulated utilities. These are, as they sound, unregulated. So they are not under the jurisdiction of the PUC. Instead, consumer complaints uh, must be filed with the Court of Common Pleas. However, there are a variety of uh, acts and uh, rules that they do have to follow. For example, the Water Services Act. If you're dealing with a municipal utility, for example, that uh, has water services, there's also for tenants what we call USTRA, which is the Utility Service Tenants Rights Act which provides uh, certain rules that tenants and landlords have to abide by for unregulated utilities. And then there's some uh, broad consumer law protections as well.
Uh, so because these are unregulated, again, not under the PUC's jurisdiction, there's no standard billing collection or termination standards. And there's also no requirement to offer these assistance programs that we're going to be talking about, as well as uh, payment arrangements that we'll be talking about. So uh, keep in mind, uh, unless we specify otherwise, these utility-run assistance programs you're going to find most likely in those regulated utilities, those larger utilities. So just a caveat slide, if you will, there. So as we're talking about assistance programs, we're going to be talking about certain FPL limits. So up to a certain limit that we'll be talking about, these households uh, are going to be eligible for assistance. So we wanted to provide you just a quick uh, kind of uh, recap slide of, of where uh, the FPL limits stand for both two-person households as well as four person households. Now, we'll provide this in uh, the PowerPoint as well when the PowerPoint is distributed. So let's get into the utility run assistance programs. The first big bucket of programs we're going to be talking about are customer assistance programs, otherwise known as CAPS. Now, these are available to large regulated gas and electric uh, customers of utilities. So uh, some regulated water companies are going to have some version of CAPS, for example, Aqua, PA American, PWSA, PDW uh, are going to have uh, some bill assistance programs or CAP programs that they might be more limited. So gas and electric are required to have these programs. What are CAPS? The benefits of CAPS for people enrolled in them are you get a reduced rate, so a CAP bill, and you get lower monthly payments. You also get what we call past due arrearages or past due debt that's then frozen once the person enters CAP, and then the person has the ability to earn forgiveness over time as they make on time payments while in CAP. So for each payment, a certain amount will be forgiven over time that they make while enrolled in CAP. So if you take one thing from this presentation or this section of the presentation, it's that the program rules for these utility run assistance programs vary. So go and check with the utility you're working with to see what their individual eligibility requirements are. But we're going to give you some general rules that we see time and time again. So for CAPS, we see the eligibility line, that FPL line time and time again set at 150% FPL for gross household income. Again, uh, check with the individual utility about these requirements, but you will most likely or pretty much across the board see some kind of requirement for periodic income verification. So when the person enters CAP, they have to uh, verify their income, their household income in some way. And then every so often, every year, or a few years, um, depending on the utility rules, they'll have to provide additional information about updated income information, update the household size potentially to figure out where they are in terms of their updated FPL. And then the practice tip we've given you on this slide is that there might be a request by utility for social security numbers. However, be uh, aware that if there is that request, it is not required. There should be alternate means uh, for providing the information to get in cap without providing social security numbers. So that's a, something to ask if you're dealing with a vulnerable person who is unwilling or unable to provide a social security number. And uh, I, there is a question uh, in the q and I'm going to pause really quickly to answer it. Is it only two or four, or does it have, let's say, one to 10 for the last chart? So we've just provided you a quick snapshot of the FPL charts uh, in that slide, slide seven. However, the answer is uh, that uh, it can be wherever the person is in terms of their family size, as long as they meet that FPL line. So for example, if they have a 10 person family, uh, per your example, uh, Latoya, it can be uh, uh, that you just have to look at what that individual FPL uh, line is for that uh, 10 person in that case household. So this is very much as a summary slide, but um, if any of you are needing a full FPL chart, those are provided online and we're happy to uh, pass on links if helpful. 
All right, so I think we can go on to the next uh, bucket of utility is run assistance programs, which are liar programs. So liar stands for low income usage reduction programs. So uh, these are really geared at providing energy efficiency measures for low income households to essentially lower uh, the monthly usage that then will in theory lower uh, the bill amount. So essentially what happens for a, a liar applicant if they're found liar eligible is that the utility will come in and conduct a free energy audit. And then depending on the uh, results of that energy audit, uh, there can be appropriate energy conservation measures that are uh, one recommended and then installed. So the uh, type of energy conservation measures can vary. Uh, they can be uh, things uh, like LEDs, power strips, however, they can be more high efficiency and durable measures as well, such as high efficiency uh, refrigerators, appliances, heating sub su sorry heating system upgrades, uh, potential weatherization measures, potential insulation measures, and LIARP. We'll talk a little bit later about some of the other programs that uh, are uh, geared at weatherization and energy efficiency. Can in theory be dovetailed with some of these other programs. Uh, so it's always also important to ask if there's other uh, programs that the individual can apply for to help. Uh, essentially get all the upgrades that can be useful to the household uh, installed within that kind of window. So again, a uh, golden rule here is that the eligibility requirements do vary by utility. However, some of the typical ones we see time and time again for liar programs is that the income FPL line for households are set normally just a little bit of that cap line. So we've given the example here of 150% to 200% FPL. PL. Again, this is going to depend on the utility. Most utilities either require some kind of high usage level or prioritize high usage level for liar participants. What that high usage is going to be is going to depend on the utility, ask the utility where their individual line falls. And then if you're working with a tenant, especially if you're looking at those high efficiency measures where the uh, utility essentially comes in and uh, does improvements to the, the household outside Side, you know, providing light bulbs and uh, power stripping, a lot of times uh, you'll see a requirement for landlord approval. The practice tip I'll give there is that a lot of utilities will have dedicated liar customer service representatives uh, that will work with uh, tenants who might need some additional uh, information provided to landlords or who might be dealing with a slightly unresponsive landlord to try to kind of bridge that gap. So if you're dealing with that situation, see if the utility has any outreach that can be done to the landlord uh, in that regard. And then uh, the uh, issue uh, or another practice tip that we'll give is that some utilities, uh, though not all, and this is becoming more rare, uh, essentially do require certain CAP participants to actually participate in LIAR or at least uh, kind of a screen for eligibility. So if they can participate, they will participate in LIAR. And the reason behind this is that uh, the LIAR uh, usage reduction can also help uh, the cap rate reduction as well. So um, there is one other question by Sally in the chat that I'll pause here for the Q&A that I'll pause here for. Who pays for liar upgrades? So assuming that the person is uh, liar eligible, the household is liar eligible, this is done through utility funding. So uh, there's other uh, or some other weatherization programs that might require, um, for example, a copay amount or something similar. But if the person or the household is liar eligible, liar uh, upgrades should be at no cost. And I, I will say that certain health and safety measures uh, might also be included in the bucket of liar upgrades that can be achieved. For example, if there's a broken window or if there's um, an issue in terms of mold remediation that uh, really prevent liar contractors from coming in and doing their job successfully, this might be covered under the health and safety budget. It's often called the H&S budget uh, for liar. So if there is something like a broken window or some other kind of remediation, mediation to really get LIARP in there, it might be able to be covered as well at no cost. So uh, great question, Sally. All right. And I think uh, barring anything else uh, or any other question, we can go to the next slide. 
All right. So next big bucket of utility rent assistance programs we're going to be talking about are hardship fund programs. Now, these are really uh, cash grants that are offered through the utilities, again, those regulated utilities. And uh, they're geared towards assisting uh, customers, low-income customers who are having trouble affording their bills uh, and staying connected to services. So again, check with the utility, individual utility about what that maximum grant amount will look, uh, will look like. But we see time and time again, it's set at or around about $500. Uh, and it's normally typically geared towards customers experiencing, again, some kind of payment crisis. And this can be, you know, an imminent termination is often one that's used uh, to uh, get hard to fund it. So again, the eligibility and program terms are going to vary by utility, but we normally see hardship funds set their maximum FPL line around a, a little bit higher than that cap FPL line. So around 200% FPL or below is the example we give here. And then um, some utilities, though it is becoming uh, a little more rare, ask for what we call good faith payments, which are recent payments uh, that the customer has made towards their account. And what the period for those payments are going to be uh, looking at is going to vary, what the amount is going to vary. We sometimes see, for example, under $150 over the last 90 days. That's one that uh, we see a, a lot. But again, this is becoming a little more rare as well. And then uh, some utilities require showing of temporary hardship. This is normally pretty easy to uh, meet for customers who are having trouble paying their bills. It can be, for example, a termination notice. It can be something like they are falling behind in their bills. And then uh, the grant must typically resolve the problem. Now, uh, the practice of here is that it can be the hardship grant by itself, or it can be the hardship grant coupled with other funding. For example, if the person has some other funding at their disposal, if a uh, lie heap is available or another source of funding is available, that can be coupled to meet that uh, kind of requirement. And that sometimes takes a little bit of advocacy if you're working with someone in that situation. Now, I think there might be another chat uh, from Dave. So I'm going to go ahead and pause and just uh, answer that, hopefully. So uh, Dave's asking, have you noticed that utility companies are less likely to give hardship funds due to the stress during COVID-19? So um, I think this uh, is a multifaceted question. So uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19, there has been um, the release both on the federal level and some other sources of additional funding that have been channeled not only through hardship funds, but some other sources. And there's an advocacy because of the issues of uh, stress, as you would put it, or the economic pressures of COVID-19 for additional hardship funding to be made available. There's also been, um, or there was at least in 2020 going into 2021, the uh, issues um, with accessing hardship funding. So some utilities, for example, uh, suspended some of their requirements in terms of good faith payments and things like that to try to get funding out specifically during that um, kind of height of that COVID-19, if you will. Now, what we're seeing now is you're dealing with the uh, coupled economic pressures that are still long lingering from COVID-19, but you're also dealing with the high inflation rates and the other economic pressures that are kind of all churning together to make low-income customers really um, uh, unable to pay their bills more than ever. So what we are finding in terms of hardship funding is, for example, you know, if a utility has X number of dollars of hardship funding available uh, during a quarter or during uh, a semi-annual period, and they've run through their funding for a specific um specific uh, county or specific sector during that uh, allotment, they might uh, essentially have a temporary closing or they might put additional restrictions like the person has to be facing termination or have a termination notice in terms of actually accessing funding during a specific period. So that is something that we do see. Um, and uh, a lot of hardship funding uh, goes through what we call dollar energy fund, which is an administrator that operates a lot of hardship funding of uh, regulated utilities. And sometimes dollar energy fund will inform us that there is a, a certain um, funding restriction or there's hold in terms of available funding. So a little bit of a nuanced question. Hopefully I answered it for you. Thanks, Dave. And there's one more question I think that came through while I was um, hopefully uh, explaining that. Is the hard to fund different than the dollar energy grant? So uh, a lot of times this will be used interchangeably, right? Because uh, a dollar DF, dollar energy fund, is the administrator for a lot of 
of hardship funds uh, that are utility runs. So sometimes I've noticed that um, providers and uh, consumers do use hardship funds and DEF um, grants interchangeably. What I would say is don't assume that if you're applying for a DEF grant, a dollar energy fund grant, that you're applying necessarily for the right utility. You need to make sure that, for example, if the person is having an issue with PPL or is having an issue with PA American Water, that you're applying for the specific hardship fund grant rather than um, a, a wrong grant. Now, you know, it can be helpful to apply for multiple hardship funds if the person is facing other issues, but, um, you know, kind of doing the due diligence about what the DEF grant is really being funneled towards, I think it's going to be the important part there. Hopefully that answered that question as well. All right, so I'm going to uh, go on to the next slide. So CARES. CARES is the last uh, bucket of utility-run assistance programs that we're going to be talking about. Um, and this is uh, often forgotten, but can be very powerful in terms of the uh, buckets we've been talking about. So uh, CARES is really targeted towards customers who are having acute issues paying their bills, who are having short-term problems that are causing inability to pay, or might also be facing particularly, vul or particularly vulnerable circumstances. So if you're working with someone who is uh, dealing with medical issues in the household, who's dealing with domestic violence issues in the household, CARES can be a very valuable uh, tool and very valuable service to use. So what does CARES provide? It provides referrals um, to social service agents Sees really those wraparound services, budget counseling. It can also potentially provide special arrangements for bill payments. And uh, care staff, we find, are normally uh, trained a, a little bit better than uh, normal utility staff to deal with customers who are particular vulnerabilities such as DV victims, DV survivors, uh, as well as uh, medical conditions in the household. So advocacy tip here, again, it's a little used, but there is a good amount of discretion the utility has to resolve customer issues. So care is definitely one to keep in mind. And uh, Gio, I think I'm going to be turning it over to you. Yes, that's right. Thanks, Ria, for running us through all of the utility um, assistance programs. Now I'm going to be talking about some other options that you might have, like, for example, Lifeline program, which is federally funded, and it's aimed at providing affordable access to phone and broadband services. So eligible households can receive a subsidy of $9.25 that can be applied towards their phone or broadband or a bundled service. And it, although it can't be used to purchase equipment, some providers do offer um, free phones to qualifying participants. So this benefit is portable. And what I mean by that is that if you switch providers, the, um, a client can re retain their lifeline support with the new service. And um, each household, as defined by an economic unit, is eligible to receive just one lifeline subsidy. So let's take a look at the eligibility criteria. If you remember the chart that we looked at at the beginning, um, the Lifeline program is has two, two ways to be eligible. You can be income-based, which means that the household is at or below 135% of the federal poverty level or categorical eligibility. So alternatively, individuals that are enrolled in assistance programs to the government, such as SNAP, Medicaid, SSI, public housing, veteran pensions, survivor benefits, all of those will automatically qualify for Lifeline. And they can apply um, through the website, usac.org slash Lifeline to find more information about the eligibility requirements or get in touch with their local service provider for assistance with the application process. Next, I want to talk about the Affordable Connectivity Program benefits. So um, this is up to $30 a month of a broadband subsidy. So um, this can help cover their internet costs and also comes with a device discount. So some providers offer a $100 discount on internet enabled devices with a co-payment of anywhere from $10 to $50. 
So households that are at or below 200% of the federal poverty level can qualify for this. And then also it has categorical eligibility like the Lifeline program does, whereas if they're enrolled in SNAP, Medicaid, et cetera, they can qualify. Um, additionally, if any member of the household has been approved for free or reduced price school lunch or breakfast, that's another area of categorical eligibility as well as being a Pell Grant recipient. So um, definitely check this program out if your client is participating in another low income program because it's likely that they'll qualify for ACP and they can find more information at FCC.gov slash ACP. Gio, I want to just um, cut in here. I apologize for interrupting. There's a question from Cynthia I thought would be helpful to address um, uh, over uh, the, you know, the uh, presentation. Uh, Cynthia is asking, do these programs only apply in specific areas of PA? For instance, how can someone who is severely disabled facing utility shutoff get immediate assistance if they live in Greencastle, PA? Now, Cynthia, uh, I'm assuming since you typed this in while Gio is talking, you are talking about uh, the ACP and Lifeline programs as opposed to the assistance run programs. And I'm going to just briefly address both, uh, or at least the utility run. I'll let Gio address the ACP and Lifeline programs. So the utility run programs can be um, added access through the specific uh, utility that is running them and calling uh, the utility assistance numbers, calling the utility representative numbers and asking about these programs is probably going to be the quickest way for someone who is unable to, for example, go to their county assistance offices. And Gio, do you want to talk about Lifeline and ACP in that regard? Yeah, um, so both of the programs that I just discussed are federally funded. So they're not only for a specific area in PA, anywhere across the state, they can apply for it. And if they do um, fall into one of those prioritized priority categories, uh, they can apply the same way um, as other folks would apply. And it just means that the, the funding, like if it were to be running out or limited, they would focus on distributing it to those categories first. Thanks, Gio. Sorry for interrupting again. No, no problem at all. Um, I'm going to talk about the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, or LIWAP, not to be confused with LIHEAP, which I'll talk about later. But this program is designed to help families that are facing financial difficulties, um, and they have to, for the regarding like their water or wastewater service. Um, so the eligibility is based on income, like the other programs that's at 150% of the federal poverty level. And it's essential to note that this program covers grants for both water and wastewater. And um, the household just has to be behind in their bill or at risk of termination or already experienced a shutoff to qualify. The other requirement for this program is that the water service provider or wastewater service provider has to agree to maintain the service for at least 90 days after the household receives the grant. And it's also worth, worth mentioning that households must not have previously received the grant for the same utility provider and service. So they got a water grant before, they're not eligible again, or vice versa, wastewater grant, but they can apply for the other one. Um, so the benefits of this is up to $2,500 for water assistance and up to $2,500 for wastewater. And this program just reopened as of um, July of this year for a limited time. So the fund and the funding is quite limited as well. So the application period is going to close on August 11th uh, or sooner if the funding runs out. So if you know someone who would be eligible for this and needs help with their water, don't delay. Apply right away and you can apply through the your local county assistance office or online on the compass.state.pa.us website. Um, and then I see a question in the chat about um, 
If an individual informally reimburses the landlord for water bill and the landlord pays the bill but is past due paying landlord, is there any way they can apply? Um, I would have to, it would depend. So I would have to take a look at the lease um, and see who is responsible. So one of the eligibility requirements for the LIWAP program is that they are the one who's you know, responsible for the bill. So even if they're a tenant, it is possible that they are considered to be the one that's responsible for the water or wastewater bill. Um, it sounds like that's a little bit more of a tricky situation. Um, but if it says in the lease that the tenant's responsible and they can show that they're, you know, paying um, and they're past due, there there may be um, a way for them to apply. And we, you can, I will have our, contact information at the end, you can feel free to reach out um, to get some clarity on that. Um, and then there's a question about if you've received it before, can you ever ask for it again? So for LIWAP, if you've received a water grant, you can apply for a wastewater grant. And if you've received a wastewater grant, you can apply for a water grant now. But if you've um, received both before, unfortunately, this is not an option that's available. Okay, thanks. And now I'm going to talk about LIHEAP, which is not open right now, but the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program is federally funded as well. Um, and it's administrated, administered in our state by the Department of Human Services. So it provides assistance for heating expenses through from November through April. And the eligible utilities are, you know, gas related heat or gas heat, electric heat, and deliverable fuel. And in some cases, this can be for water if water is required to heat the home, like for example, you know, steam heat radiators. Um, the types of assistance that you can get through LIHEAP are a cash grant, a crisis grant, which is for, you know, emergencies, and then crisis interface or weatherization, which can help with um, emergency furnace repair replacement. And um, I know I said that the heating part of LIHEAP is closed right now, but they do have this LIHEAP crisis cooling pilot program that's currently open for applications. Um, so to be eligible for cooling, they have to have received assistance from LIHEAP or the weatherization assistance program within the last year. And this entitles them to some free cooling equipment. So they can get an installation of air conditioners or repair their cooling system from weatherization providers. And um, they can provide proof, like their letter confirming that they were, they received LIHEAP or the weatherization assistance program assistance and they'll provide that to their local weatherization ad agency to qualify. Uh, we'll discuss more about the weatherization assistance program on the next slide and um, how to find, you know, your the weatherization agency that serves your county online through DCED. So for LIHEAP, the client would need to pay or would need to apply through the county assistance office or through Compass, um, but for WAP, um, but for the LIHEAP cooling crisis pilot or the crisis interface weatherization furnace repair, they would be applying through their local weatherization assistance program or WAP agency to perform the work um, under the oversight of DCED. And I'm just going to talk about WAP, which, like I mentioned before, is funded by the Department of Energy and administered by DCED. And this is for households that their income level is at 200% of the federal poverty level. Again, priorities given to the elderly, individuals with a disability, families with the children, and high energy users. They just have to be a Pennsylvania resident. And if they're a tenant, they need to have permission from their landlord to do this type of work. Um, it's slowly expanding to include those who reside in multifamily buildings as well. 
and they also have a budget for health and safety. So the their deferral program is designed to help those who might have an issue that's preventing installation of measures in the home, like for example, mold or another health and safety issue that needs to be addressed before, you know, doing siding or insulation and things like that. Um, you also might be familiar with the whole home repairs program that's um, funded through American Rescue Plan. Um, and this, the reason I mentioned whole home repairs is because this program can work in tandem with the weatherization assistance program to provide these health and safety repairs. Uh, and I'm sure you're more familiar with um, whole home repairs, but I just wanted to point that out so that you know um, that that might be an option to apply for both to get health, get, if they have a lot of health and safety issues that need to be addressed, to have a higher budget to repair and update the home and adapt them, um, and then get the the WAP providers in there to do the other, um, inst and to install the other measures. Now I just have a few tips um, on connecting to utility service for the first time or reconnecting to utility service after you're terminated or you move. Um, the first thing I wanna mention is that CAP eligible households are not required to pay a security deposit when they connect to a utility service. So even if you don't enroll in CAP when you sign up for utility service, uh, it's not necessary, but they might require you to prove that you would be cap eligible to waive the security deposit. Although we do recommend that, you know, you enroll in cap, but um, if that's an option, but yeah, so essentially if you're at 150% of the federal poverty level or below and you're being asked for a security deposit, you just need to show proof of income and the utility will waive that for you. Uh, the next rule here is the four-year rule. So um, debt that's more than four years old can't be demanded as a condition to um, setting someone up with service um, or providing that utility service. And then the next um, point here is about customers with a PFA, a protection from abuse or court order um, indicating domestic violence and the special protections that they have. So they have to provide the utility with a copy to prove that they do have the order. And with that comes um, a few protections. So the first one is that um, a survivor of domestic violence with a PFA cannot have the utility service shut off or terminated due to non-payment for service already furnished in the names of persons other than the customer. So to break that down, that means is the utility company is not allowed to charge um, a survivor, a victim of domestic violence for debts that are accumulated by someone else, even if the victim resided um, with the abuser at the residence during that time, um, it's just, it, it, there's protections for them in the law. So we've got um, the protection against termination. And then also customers with a PFA are eligible for more flexible payment arrangements. Uh, based on their individual circumstances and needs. And um, with that comes also additional notice requirements. The utility company has to attempt to make personal contact uh, just before termination. As you can imagine, somebody who's um, a survivor of domestic violence might not you know, be too keen to come to the door and answer the door. Um, and so that just allows them an extra time if, they, if the utility company doesn't make personal contact right before termination, they'll need to come back. Uh, they'll have to post a notice at the property and come back in 48 hours. So that gives them the extra time uh, that the termination will be delayed. And with this, I will just talk quickly about um, preventing termination and the rules here. So um, we've got a rule about timing. Terminations are permitted from Monday to Thursday, not allowed on Fridays. Reasons, um, terminations can happen if they have not paid an undisputed delinquent account. They can also occur if customers 
fail to comply with the terms of a payment agreement or don't complete a security deposit or deny access tampering without equipment. That's a big no-no. Um, notice requirements, all utility um, consumers are entitled to written notice of termination um, at least 10 days before termination date. And that notice is effective for 60 days. So if the, you're signed up with a PUC regulated utility, you have service with a PUC regulated utility, they need to be providing notice before termination. And then personal contact within three days before termination. Um, this just could, means that they need to try to let you know um, 72 hours before. And this could be in person by phone or through electronic means like an email or text. Be careful when signing up for, you know, um, e-notifications because you might have agreed to receive these notices um, electronically during, you know, initial sign up for utility services. And then there's also this thing called the last knock rule. So this means the, the PUC regulated utility company has to make an attempt to personally contact the customer at their residence just before the scheduled termination. And then I will just briefly go over payment arrangements. Um, so let's summarize the differences between a utility issued payment arrangement, and public utility issued payment arrangement. If it's utility issued, these agreements are provided by the utility to customers who acknowledge their liability for the build service, but need more time to pay the outstanding balance. So customers need to be careful about admitting liability unless they are sure that that's the exact amount they owe. And it's also essential for customers to only agree to a payment arrangement that they can afford so that they don't sign up, sign up. Um, set themselves up for failure and um, create further financial strain. So utilities do have a lot of discretion. So advocate on behalf of your clients or yourself to uh, to um, get a payment arrangement um, and they can do it for multiple, they can do multiple pull of them for various durations. Um, so you might have to ask for longer terms if uh, the amount is too high. On the other hand, PUC issued payment arrangements um, for utilities regulated by the PUC uh, are, are a little bit different. So current customer is defined as a customer who's currently using utility service or within 30 days of being terminated. So those customers that are below 150% of the federal poverty level can negotiate a payment payback time frame of up to five years. Um, and the PUC SU payment arrangement is usually a one-time deal. They can't compel a utility to enter into another one unless there's extraordinary circumstances. And then applicants for service, on the other hand, are those who have already terminated longer than 30 days um, at the same address. So there's a reconnection fee that's cost-based, meaning that it covers the expenses incurred for reestablishing service. And then this is for customers with incomes if a customer has an income at or below 150% of FPL, the payback timeframe can be up to 24 months if they are considered an applicant for service. In other words, they're already terminated. So it's a lot easier to address issues before a, um, someone's terminated than it is afterwards. So we always try to get them connected with all the programming possible before termination because then the options become a lot more limited. And then last slide before I pass it back to Rhea is just some of the um, ways that you can use a medical certificate to prevent termination of utility service. So if a member of the household has a serious illness or medical condition that requires service for their treatment, like for example, conditions like asthma, which requires air conditioning during the summer or diabetes where they have to refrigerate medication, this is where a medical certificate comes in handy. Um, the decision on which medical conditions qualify for a med cert is made by a medical professional. It's not made by the utility company. So the utility should not be telling you that your medical condition doesn't qualify. Um, it's up to the doctor or licensed professional. Um, and once that medical certificate is obtained, then it prevents termination for, it holds it for 30 more days. And Customers can renew a medical certificate every 30 days if they um, up for up to two times, providing with an extra 90 days of protection, even if they don't pay the current charges. 
If they are paying current charges every 30 days, they can just renew it and just keep paying the last 30 days of service. And now I will pass it back to Rhea. Thanks, Gio. And I'm trying to be cognizant of time. We're about 10 minutes out to the end of the presentation. We do have uh, some additional information we want to give you about tenant protections, but I want to make sure I'm pausing here uh, to uh, make sure that no one wants to drop in additional questions. I promised I would stop here for a Q&A, but if there's no additional questions. I'm going to go on and provide just a few minutes of tenant protections for you guys, if that is okay with our uh, moderator, Jen, as well. Of course, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and Rhea and Gia will take them um, as they continue to present their materials. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate it. So let me just say the tenant protections related to utility rights can be a whole presentation in and of itself. But we wanted to provide you guys some uh, snapshot rules, if you will, related to this. So uh, first of all, the takeaway from the slide, if nothing else, is that there's USTRA, which is the Utility Service Tenants Rights Act. USTRA is for unregulated utilities. On the flip side is the DSLPA, which is the Discontinuance of Service to Lease Premises Act. Now, this is for those regulated utilities. So USTRA unregulated, DSLPA regulated. And a lot of the provisions of USTRA and DSLPA are going to mirror each other. All right, we can go on to the next slide. So uh, normally, USTRA and DSLPA cases arise if you're dealing with a utility company who's trying to terminate services to a lease premises, or you're dealing with a landlord who's looking to voluntarily discontinue service. In those cases, it, there might be protections under USTRA or DSLPA to help. So uh, normally the following has to be true so the landlord is uh the utility on the utility as the named customer if it's ustra so again unregulated it does not matter whether the lease says it's in the tenant's responsibility if it's under dslpa the landlord must be responsible for service under the terms of the lease however under both there's no requirement for a written lease and or a lease can suffice so um normally also there's a requirement that the tenant took possession session while the utility service was active and that uh, the proposed termination of service is due to an issue related to non-payment or uh, in the case of a uh, landlord voluntary request to terminate service as opposed to some other reasons such as unsafe conditions or need for a repair or meter tampering. So if you are in essentially USTRA or DSLPA, uh, kind of territory. If a utility is in a landlord's name and the landlord does not pay, a renter must be, one, notified of the landlord's arrearages 30 days in advance of the termination, given the opportunity to pay the last 30-day bill, so essentially that forward-looking bill, and then allowed to pay the utility bills then going forward. And there is an anti-retaliation clause related to this, but then deduct from rent uh, without taking on the debt of the landlord for those past due uh, debt amounts. And then again, there is that protection for retaliation. Sometimes that does require referral to uh, legal services. So a landlord or owner may not voluntarily shut off service while um, it's occupied by a tenant without notarized consent or in the case of uh, emergencies. Uh, so a tenant must be given essentially notice and the ability to keep the service on going forward based on these terms. So I'm going to pause here because there is um, one a comment by Nora, uh, Norma, I apologize, that uh, a lot of times payment arrangement PARs cannot uh, be affordable and that uh, they will not work for customers who have poor payment histories. Norma is exactly correct. A lot of people enter into PARs without actually knowing that they're even in a PAR. They've done it through, for example, an IVR system, and it's just not affordable for them. That's a point of advocacy, absolutely, if you're working with someone who is seeking a PAR. But we always say look to cap first in terms of affordability if they are a cap eligible. And then if there's past payment history that's bad, they might uh, absolutely not get as good of a payment arrangement or not be qualified for a payment arrangement. Again, this might be something advocacy might help as utilities have wide discretion in this regard. And then Laura is also asking in chat, do you have any information available so we can download print for future use? Yes, we'll provide some resources at the end for uh, future information and also our contact information. Thanks, Laura. 
So uh, let's go to the next slide. So additional tenant protections under either UST or a DSLPA. So there's a right to deduct payments for rent owed. Again, there's an anti-retaliation clause that's kind of coupled with this. And then uh, essentially, if there is a tenant who's made payments under UST or a DSLPA, they can uh, essentially look to uh, the uh, deduction of that payments towards the, or from the rent owed. Again, once again, anti-retaliation uh, by the landlord, which sometimes does require a referral to legal services. And then on that same kind of uh, for flip side of that coin, protection from constructive eviction. So that form of retaliation is also within UST and DSLPA. And then neither UST or DSLPA is waivable. So if you're looking at a lease term that uh, purports to waive these, something to keep in mind. Then we can go to the next slide. So foreign load, I'm just going to explain what foreign load is and then tell you what to do if there's a foreign load issue, because it can be very difficult to navigate. So foreign load is essentially if uh, there is an issue with a tenant's bill where it looks like or there is a electric uh, meter that is sharing a uh, usage so the customer is getting a usage from either another uh, unit or a potentially a common area which the landlord should be responsible for paying that common area. Technically, if there's a foreign load issue, the landlord is technically responsible for paying the full bill uh, until the foreign load issue is removed. There's also protection from retaliation in this regard uh, within DSLPA and Ustra where uh, the tenant will, one, be protected from retaliation, but also have the ability to just pay for bills moving forward rather than past due amounts. Keep in mind that this is going to be uh, looking, uh, foreign load issues are going to be more in DSLPA land, so you're going to be looking at the regulated water, electric, and natural gas utilities. The Real practice tip I'll give you is if you're dealing with a foreign load issue, you're going to really want to consult um, not only the utilities, but potentially someone who works on foreign load issues regularly, such as our uh, office, because foreign load issues can be really hard to one, detect, and then navigate. So really, if you sussing out if there's a foreign load issue is going to be, uh, you know, 90% of that initial battle. So let us know if there's a potential foreign load issue. We can help you navigate that. And then really quickly with the last two minutes we have left, we would just want to throw up um, on the next slide, if we go past that next title slide, Geo, uh, information related to the PUC dispute process. And we can go forward actually to the next slide. Great. Now, yeah. Thank you, Gia. Uh, no oh, I'm sorry, yeah. that's you. So I'm going to yeah, stop can... and not go past that. Go ahead. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> yeah, I can just take this last substantive slide through the end. So um, for PUC complaints, uh, the first step before you even get to the PUC is to initiate a dispute with the utility. The utility does have the obligation to address disputes that are raised by customers. So um, just know that they, you have to communicate with them. Use these magic words, you know, clearly say, I am disputing blank to express your disagreement with the specific charges or issues. And you can request a report or account um, status and obtain a detailed, obtain detailed information about your client's billing and services. In the meantime, they have to continue paying only any undisputed bills during the re dispute resolution process. Um, and they have to give the utility an opportunity to resolve it before going to the PUC. The next step is file the informal complaint at the PUC. Contact the Bureau of Consumer Services. Um, you can call them. You can file out a, fill out a form online. And this will temporarily halt termination if you um, contact them before the scheduled termination date. If all does not go well with the informal complaint, if the dispute is not resolved informally, a formal complaint can be filed. So then they'll go before an administrative law judge and have um, a hearing and the appeals are directed to Commonwealth Court. If ne that's the next step after the formal complaint. Please note that representation before the PUC requires a licensed attorney. If you're an advocate or a paralegal, you can refer clients to file pro se and walk them through the process and provide information about their rights to them. And at this time, we are right on the dot 12 o'clock. If you have any questions or comments, you can feel free to contact us. Um, and there's our info right there. 
Thank you so much to our wonderful presenters for this super informative presentation. And thank you all to the attendees for coming today and being engaged with the material and asking your questions. Um, we will be sending out all the materials in about a week's time. Um, so with that, I bid you all a really good day and I thank you all for being with us for your afternoon. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone.